Um, thanks for getting up early on a Saturday morning. I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. My name is Mark Gunther. I work as a, a writer on business and sustainability for Guardian Sustainable Business, among other places. More importantly, I am a very proud board member of Net Impact. And we're going to get right to our conversation here. Uh, I'm not really going to do much in the way of introductions. I'm just going to tell you that on my far right is Jahi Chappell, who is the Director of Agroecology and Agricultural Policy at a local organization called the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. And next to me here is Natalie De Nicola. She's Vice President of Sustainability and Partnerships at Monsanto. And we're going to have probably a somewhat geeky conversation this morning about things like GMOs, productivity, organic agriculture, large farms versus small farms, trade policy. But bef we have a professor, by the way, on the far right here, so we're going to definitely recovering. be a little geeky, or a recovering professor. But before we do that, like, like the game show hosts do, I'm going to give you a chance to meet our panelists. They're not contestants, they're panelists. So we're going to do a quick Twitter round of questions to get to know these folks, and I'm just going to pop a question at each of you, try to answer in 140 characters. I know that's hard for a former academic. So, <laughs> education. Where'd you go to school and what did you study, Natalie? I went to school 150 miles south of here in Winona, Minnesota at St. Mary's College. I studied environmental biology um, and chemistry and I got a doctorate in environmental toxicology at um, UW-Madison. Spent a lot of time watching um, bird habitat in marshes just a bit south of here, um, watching bird nesting habitat. Any badgers out there, Wisconsin? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Jahi. Uh, I went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, <laughs> woo! I like the blue. Uh, so my undergraduate was in chemical engineering, and uh, I returned to Michigan a couple years later for my PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology. Great. And first job out of college, Natalie. Out of college. Um, I felt like I wanted to be a professor, but I wanted to learn something about other kinds of um, positions students could have in science. So I actually took a fellowship um, on Capitol Hill, working for a U.S. congressman on environmental issues, paid for by um, a scientific society as a science fellow. Hmm. Jahi? Uh, I was a body wash formulation engineer for Procter & Gamble. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. And how many years at Monsanto? Were we all? <laughs> How many years at Monsanto now? Uh, 16. And Johnny, how long have you been at the IATP? Uh, just over a year now. Just over a year. As you said, I was a professor before at Washington State University. Great. And uh, what was the first rock concert you went to? Uh, Bruce Springsteen. Don't you want to give us a year? Hmm? You want to give us a year? Uh, probably about 1985. Okay. <laughs> so the first rock concert I went to, I think, was Ziggy Marley. But actually, probably the first one I remember was Chris Rock, which was, uh, I think, an even better uh, concert. Okay. And last one of this, favorite food? Yeah, this one's tough. Well, I'm Italian, so I'm going to have to say rigatoni. Mmm. So hard. Creme brulee? Ooh. That's a good one. Okay. I'm a dessert guy myself. Um, okay. So now we're going to get to it. Um, I really want to start with Natalie because... If you read about Monsanto in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Fortune Magazine, Business Week, you get one picture. If you Google Monsanto on the web, you get a very, very different picture of what the company is. And I want to try to get some facts out there about Monsanto. So maybe let's start with just how big is the company, what are your revenues, how many employees, how many customers, how much do you sell in the U.S. versus the rest of the world? Give us a sketch there. Okay. But I have to just start with one real quick note. Um, I've spoken in a number of audiences on food security and environmental sustainability and to a number of universities as well. Um, and I just have to honestly say that I think that you're one of the most um, important audiences that I've had the privilege, privilege to address because in just talking with some of you, um, you really seem to be very aware of the kind of um, global challenges that are on your shoulders and ready to face the challenge. So um, just thank you very much for the chance to be here. 
Um, so Monsanto, um, maybe if I can just start to talk a little bit about what our company is, is that okay? Yeah, but try and be succinct on this okay. part. So our company is 100% um, focused on agriculture. Um, we're one of the few companies that are. So really focused on farmers and what their needs are. Um, we have about 22,000 employees around the world, many of them scientists, uh, many of them working with farmers on the ground. Our company is really very focused on trying to use um, science as a way to give us um, different insights into how we can help farmers um, produce more food and use their resources, natural resources, more efficiently while they do that. Um, we have about half of our business in the United States, half of it um, in different countries around the world. and. Um, we try to improve crops, including a lot of vegetables, such as melons and um, broccoli and tomatoes, as well as corn, cotton, and canola. Okay, that's a great start. So let's try and fact check some of the, the assumptions or claims about Monsanto. One is, you know, Monsanto is all about GMOs. Can you tell us about how much of your revenue comes from genetically modified seeds and crops versus the rest? Well, what I can... So thanks for that question because it's it is something that I think folks think of us as a hundred. We're just all about GMOs. The truth is our company um, we're we're big in R and D investments around science, and more than half of our R and D investment has traditionally gone towards conventional breeding. Just the concept of um, trying to uh, that's been used for a long time to take different parents and cross them and try to make um, offspring that can produce more and be more efficient. And we have some pretty advanced techniques where we try to do that to make really smarter decisions. We also have genetic modification, which is another uh, tool that builds on that. So I really look at it as breeding helps increase the potential of, of the plant to produce. And biotechnology traits such as um, protecting the plant from insects, helping to control weeds, and now um, trying to help control drought helps protect that potential. And now we have two new um, platforms that we've been really investing in. One is in the area of precision agriculture, which is where we're really trying to help farmers um, get the information they need to make really smart decisions throughout the year about what kind of plant, what kind of variety to plant where, how much water to apply and when, how much nutrients, fertilizer to apply and when, how to factor in data um, around weather, because weather is such a huge challenge. You've got to think about farmers. Um, it's a very risky business where they're having to deal with weather amongst other challenges. And so really trying to take a very systems approach of how we can help farmers um, utilize their, their resources as efficiently as possible and maintain their livelihoods. And then the last platform that I wanted to mention is this area of biologicals, which is really natural compounds. Um, a number of different applications there, one around trying to help improve the health of honeybees. Don't know how many folks pay attention to honeybees, but they're so important to what we eat and every day, um, and they're in some trouble. So that's one area. Another area around, for instance, um, helping to promote better bacteria around the roots of a plant so the plant can, can uh, absorb nutrients more efficiently. So big, um, very a number of different areas we're investing a lot of our our research and development, um, but we've had um, uh, work with a lot of companies around our breeding and biotechnology and really licensed to a number of different companies around the world as well. And, and do you know roughly what percentage of revenues comes from GMOs? I don't know that exact answer. Okay. Um, another area where Monsanto uh, certainly has gotten attention is around intellectual property. Uh, Monsanto sues farmers who save and reuse its seed. True? So when we produce the seed, we do the kind of science we talked about. I want you to think about what that looks like for a minute. Really advanced, um, pretty cool stuff that's trying to understand how we can make these smarter decisions and using understanding the, the DNA of the plant um, and now more and more the understanding of how that interacts with the soil and the weather and things like that. Um, those are hundreds of millions of dollars in investment to develop seed like that. And so when we first did that with GMO seed and, and through breeding and biotech, we basically talked to farmers 
and said, you know, here's the kind of benefit this can bring you in terms of helping you reduce some of your pesticide applications, helping you use um, water more efficiently, these different things. But this is what it costs for us to be able to invest it and how can, or to develop it. How can we work through a system um, where we're going to be able to continue to do this for you and continue to make these kind of investments? And so we arranged um, arrangements with farmers in the United States where basically they were willing because with some of these crops, we could sell it to them once and then they could just keep planting it. We'd never be able to recoup investment. We wouldn't be able to continue that R&D they agreed that we should have an arrangement where essentially um, they would pay us for the seed every year. But they wanted to make sure How that did they their indicate their agreement with that? Pardon me? How did they indicate with their agreement with that? Was this a, a plebiscite? This was that conversations they, they, we had with different with growers. We work with growers all the time. And in this case, at this point, it's a contract that we have with them where it's very transparently outlined what we're agreeing to. and. Um, the, what they expressed, though, is they wanted it to be a fair playing field. If they're paying for the seed, they want their neighbors to pay for that seed as well. And so um, we sell in the United States to about 275,000 farmers a year. In the 17 years that we've been um, selling these seeds, and they've been very, very uh, successful, farmers really like them and adopt them, um, we've had in 147 cases the situation where we had to take some sort of action. And this is something that... Um, and this is because essentially they signed a contract saying we won't commercially sell the seeds or replant the seeds, and then you discovered that they did. They didn't honor that contract. Right. And so um, it's a decision you have to... It's really, really a hard decision for us. I mean, people worry about this. They, we look into it very carefully to try to understand is there any other way we can try to work through this. Um, it's not something you take lightly. If you're a company that's 100% focused on agriculture, that means 100% of your business is dependent on farmers and their success. We want them to be successful. We don't want to be in some sort of a conflict with them. Um, in most of those cases, all but 12, we were able to resolve them. 12 cases in that entire history have actually gone to court, and in all cases, the court found in our favor that this wasn't something that accidentally happened this farmer broke the contract. Um, when we do um, recoup fines for that, that gets donated into the charities in the, in the communities where it happens. So our, our whole goal here, I mean, we're really about trying to help support farmers in their communities, um, but we um, want to be able to continue this positive relationship with farmers where, we're, where we're, we continue to invest in new and better tools and information to help them uh, with their livelihoods. Okay, so in your view, it's not really different from the record industry or the movie industry or the tech industry protecting its intellectual property, and it's been a very small number of cases where you've had to sue your customers. Okay. Um, Jai, I'm going to bring you in in one sec here, but the other thing you read everywhere on the Internet is Monsanto controls the food system, or let's rephrase it to say Monsanto has undue influence over the food system. Um, maybe a good fact to know would be what kind of market share you have, say, in the corn and soy industry, which are the most grown commodity crops in the U.S., I believe. So the way that we um, have developed our business model is that we do have seed com a seed company brand. We also license the biotechnology traits very broadly to seed companies. So a couple hundred seed companies in the United States um, and other seed companies around the world. The idea there is, um, as we're making these kind of R&D investments, we want to really make them available to farmers through lots of different seed companies that they've, they're used to working with and give them as much choice as possible. So if you look at all the seeds in the world, um, our market share is probably something like 5%. Hmm. If you look at corn and soybeans in the U.S., it's probably something like a third in, in our brand. Um, if you look at some other parts of the world, um, let's say India, it's about 2% of our market share for our seed brand. Um, our, the biotechnology traits are used very broadly in some countries through this licensing model. Okay. So you're not counting the ones that are licensed in that percentage? Well, the way I look at that is we want farmers to have lots of choices. And oftentimes farmers have a relationship with their seed company that they've been doing business with for a really long time and we want to honor that. Um, 
But not all seed companies, especially if they're smaller seed companies, can make the kind of R&D investments that we're talking about. And I think one of the things that's important for, for this room and this audience that makes me so excited to be here is I think that you um, realize that we have some very significant challenges ahead of us as a society, as a planet. Whether it's about trying to help eliminate hunger, whether it's about trying to help protect biodiversity, combat climate change, protect human rights, empowerment of women and girls. These are really big, complex challenges that no one company or organization can solve alone, um, but they're real and they're going to require us bringing the best of both the public and the private sector to bear to try to address them. And so um, the way I look at that is as a company very focused on R&D investment in agriculture, trying to provide farmers with better tools. And we've been focusing a lot on the biological sciences. Now we're starting to focus a lot on data science and bringing the power of those two areas together for the benefit of these tools and information that can help farmers make better choices that help all of us. Um, I think it's really important that we try to find ways to make that kind of um, R&D advancement available even in seed companies that wouldn't ever be able to afford that kind of R&D. And so um, that's why I look at the licensing model as a really important way of enabling a lot of choice, really honoring and respecting the different kind of relationships farmers have with their seed companies, but also allowing those seed companies to provide those farmers with the best tools and stay competitive. All right, so Johnny, let me turn to you on this because well, I, uh, I want to give you a chance to follow up sure. on this last comment. Let's okay. let's let's sort of um, not have quite such a narrow focus on Monsanto and talk about Monsanto and maybe the three or four other big ag biotech companies out mm -hmm. there. You know, Pioneer, Syngenta, BASF. Do you think that industry as a group, because they do all share intellectual property, they license back and forth, et cetera, do you think they have undue influence over food production in the U.S.? I Collectively, they probably have a 90%, 95% market share on seeds and fertilizers and pesticides and all of that. Yeah, so it varies by what product you're talking about, but by most measures, uh, many of the ag input markets and uh, buyers markets as well are ol ol oligopolies. They're over concentrated and by definition more or less they have undue influence those minority of companies over the overall market. Uh, not to mention Monsanto is many times larger than a lot number of co uh, countries as many of your competitors are as well and I would say it's pretty hard to argue that that doesn't end up even accidentally uh, having undue influence if you believe in the United States, as we supposedly believe in the United States, that uh, money is speech, then they have millions and millions more times speech than people, and 10, 20 times more speech than a lot of countries. To follow up on that, and then I want to ask you about IATP, just to give you a chance to explain, but just to quickly follow up on that, aren't farmers growing the seeds and using the technology that Monsanto and its competitors are providing because they've made a decision that that's the best thing for their business, it's the best way they're going to make money. Um, many of these as you, are you know, second and third generation farmers who want to pass their land on. I mean, why do you question the effectiveness of the market in terms of giving us the food system that we have now in the U.S.? Well, it's important to note we've lost thousands upon thousands of farmers, so not all of them made this choice. Uh, and even some of those that did make that choice weren't able to make it. Now we could argue that they were less efficient, but actually what we've seen is a lot of pressure for really cheap input costs. We have really low prices for corn right now. We have really low prices for a lot of inputs into feed for animals, corn syrup, all these uh, processed food products. That's really great for the small number of companies that are buying from, from farmers and are able to demand really low prices. And the small number of companies that are selling to them, they're really able to demand this premium that I don't think all the farmers freely chose it, uh, especially given that there's so few companies. If you only have a couple of companies to choose from, then uh, the really basic economic theory says they don't even have to collude, which would be illegal, to have the price be higher than it should be socially optimum. And so you squeeze those farmers, those farmers that are able to stay in, have limited choices, and sure, they choose from the choices they have there, and I'm sure they're going to choose the ones that maybe 
yield best within this choice, but we've really, really locked ourselves into a system of making a lot of one thing on farms that's very efficient for making processed food, that's not efficient for a diverse diet, for biodiversity, for conserving the environment, for retaining nitrogen and not having it run off into the Gulf of Mexico. There's tons of empirical, peer-reviewed research that environmentally these more diverse farms and smaller farms are actually going to produce more positive goods for the uh, environment as well as actually keeping more money in the local community. We have a lot of problems in our rural communities. A lot of that money is going out to these companies. Willie Lockeritz, among other people, has found that smaller farms that use less purchased inputs keep more money in the community. And so the problem is you have all these things like the environmental quality and diversity that aren't uh, uh, paid for in the market. They're externalities. And with that, then, yes, it makes sense for a number of these farmers to take what essentially ends up being smaller and smaller and smaller margins to produce more and more. Uh, it's called the treadmill of production. The treadmill of production. And so that you get locked in because each year, because of farming, if you didn't make the profit you uh, wanted to, you just have to try and make more next year. The price keeps going down. Unlike many other industries, there's very hard for farmers to exit the market and just enter some other way of being, some other occupation. So what farmers tend to do is try and produce more and more, which drives the prices down, which makes it even harder for them, and they jump on a lot of things that do work for them in this very constrained system. I think it's crazy to think it's a, a free choice when you, you're up against several comp companies of the size of countries. So what's the alternative? Maybe that gives you a chance to talk a little about what you do at IATP. Your title is Director of Agroecology. So what would an alternative look like? Tell us a little about your organization and its purpose and how you're trying to drive us to a different vision of what agriculture would look like. Sure. So the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy uh, here in Minneapolis, we're almost 30 years old. Uh, we were founded by the current Secretary of State, Mark Ritchie. Uh, and we really have been focused for those nearly 30 years on trying to support farmers to use sustainable systems that are sustainable for them economically, that allow farmers to stay on the farm, that allow them to use diverse systems, uh, pass their farm on to their children, get more farmers involved, really making sure that they get the prices they need at the same time as being able to use more sustainable practices. We're also concerned with food access, with people being able to access diverse, sufficient food uh, around the world, especially within the United States. And a big, big element of this is trade. And so uh, a huge focus of our work has always been looking at the trade deals we see uh, negotiated you know, from NAFTA to right now we have TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and uh, TTIP, because these really aren't transparent. So we had a, a, an office in Geneva for a while looking at the World Trade Organization just to make sure the decisions being made in trade deals, which very few people are privy to, we don't see the text of it you know, in your newspaper, uh, to say, well, let's make sure that we are analyzing this, we're saying what's coming out of WTO, we're sending it to our allies, we're sending it to farmers groups, we're sending it to consumers groups, making sure that we know what we're supposedly agreeing to, and that we've had a lot of deals that have hurt farmers. Uh, for many years we worked very much on, on dumping where we were selling food below the cost of production, and that really put a lot of farmers out of the business in the rest of the world, and hurt a lot of our farmers here because they had to sell their food for less than it costs to make it. And so really trying to address that has been our, our reason for being. Uh, in terms of the alternative, I mean, I think that there's, there's so many opportunities out there and it's very exciting. It's part of the reason it's exciting to be in food right now is that not only do we have thousands if not millions of people pushing for an alternative system, but we have the science for it. So the uh, science for it? The science know? for it, yeah. Sorry, professor, talk fast. Uh, um, so, my, by training, uh, I have a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology. My specific area is agroecology. And uh, it's something that I've brought a renewed focus into ITP. We've always been interested in sustainable ag. But unlike sustainable agriculture or organic, which are important terms, agroecology is a scientific field. I was the chair of the agroecology section of the Ecological Society of America, you know, so it's, it's, there's thousands of people who are agroecologists. Um, so it's a scientific field, but there's also, associated with the science, uh, a lot of practices, alternative practices to the input-heavy manufactured pesticide, manufactured per, uh, fertilizer system, uh, as well as 
arguably millions of people who are part of a movement for agroecology and food sovereignty. Um, so in terms of talking to the farmers, there's a group called La Via Campesina, the Peasant Farmers Organization, a worldwide group that has members in 80 countries represent millions of farmers, and there certainly wasn't a vote among them on what the best system would be. And the problem with just saying the market can figure it out is when the farmers don't have money, they don't have that vote. You don't have a choice. If it works for a certain number of farmers that have more money, and they choose those seeds, and Monsanto or whatever company offers a limited array of seeds, if you don't have money and you're a farmer in Zimbabwe, how do you voice your vote against that? You don't have money to purchase things barely to start with, much less to have a protest vote and purchase other seeds. But in terms of the deposit alternatives, so uh, mentioned yeah. precision agriculture. What would, what would agroecology look like? I think yeah. probably like I'm like many people in the audience who don't really know what that means. Yeah, so yeah, let me step back a couple of steps. So uh, very basically agroecology says agriculture is an ecosystem like every other ecosystem. And so even though it is man, uh, human managed, it has to act the same way as other ecosystems. It can't act by its own set of natural laws. And so from that, we can figure out things that work better given what we know about ecosystems. We can do better in measuring the impact of agriculture on other ecosystems. And there are certain practices derived from that that decrease the synthetic inputs, that decrease uh, the amount of energy you need to use, um, at the same time as being better for farmers, which is, I'd say is the third component of agroecology, uh, looking at the fact that agriculture is not just ecological, it's also social and cultural and economic, and you have to work with farmers and listen to them uh, really in a deep democratic way, uh, which is what food sovereignty is about, really having conversations as much as you can as equals rather than one person coming with a lot more power. But the specific practices, uh, one example in terms of precision agriculture, uh, colleagues of mine, Jennifer Blesch and Lori Drinkwater, both who are, are soil biology chemists, um, they did some research saying, okay, well, we've got what's called green manure, uh, crop rotations or cover crops with plants that fix nitrogen into the soil. And this is something that's been used for, for eons. And in many cases, it can replace most, if not all, of synthetic nitrogen input when you do it correctly and still get uh, really good yields, if not equal yields, still really profitable yields. Uh, what they also found is that precision agriculture, if you look across all the scientific data we have to date, precision ag can, on average, lead to a reduction in excess nitrogen, nitrogen going into the water, into the Gulf of Mexico, of around th 3 to 20%. With proper cover cropping or crop rotations, you can get from 5 to 40 percent reduction in nitrogen runoff. And they found that the average is two to three times better reductions in nitrogen runoff with these methods than with precision agriculture. But are, are there sacrifices in terms of the cost of the crops when you do agroecology? Are there sacrifices in terms of the amount of yield per acre when you compare it to the more common monoculture that we have in places like Minnesota and Iowa and Illinois? So it varies, um, and the research is still out. I was part of a study, and, and, and there's been several since then, finding that on average you probably could produce around 97% with alternative practices of what the yields we get now. Um, more recent estimates said it was 75%, though they said if you use best practices that goes up to sort of 85% or so. And this is when agroecology has gotten at best 1% of the kind of research funding that the typical system of uh, intensive inputs and GMOs have gotten. And so it seems to me hard to argue that if we can get from 75 to 86 to 97% of the yield with a system that's had 1% of the research budget, that we can improve that a lot if we actually focused on it. And the trade-off is, uh, frankly, that when you use these methods, it depends more on the knowledge, skill, and complex management by farmers, which takes more education and support, more extension often, but they get to keep that money. They're not spending the money on pesticides or fertilizer or as much of it. Uh, so there's also been research in Africa looking at agroecological methods, and you could double yield with half the fertilizer of just trying to use you know, the typical hybrids and uh, fertilizer method. And if we can do that, if we can, in Africa, and this is where the research is, is in many ways the strongest, uh, everyone, or many of us, if everyone working in the food area knows that Africa actually 
is one of the few places in the world where there's some countries that don't produce enough within their own borders to feed everyone. Most countries in the world, even very poor ones, produce enough food within their own borders. Africa is, is the exception to that in, in certain countries in Africa. And so everyone agrees that there needs to be more productivity among certain farmers. Uh, what we see, though, is that with agroecological methods among hundreds of farmers on um, thousands of example plots and, and millions of acres, they uh, increased their yield by two or three times. Now, the numbers in general say that, okay, farmers in Africa are getting maybe one half, maybe as little as one fifth of the yield they could be getting that we see you know, in Iowa. So actually, it makes sense that we could double their yields with agroecology even without the full potential of it, because if you're doubling it from a position of one third, then sure, maybe it's 60%, but let's start with what we know from the science are less impactful methods and just double it and see if that works. You know, maybe, especially without more research, we won't get to the Iowa yields in Malawi, but if we can double or triple what they have now with methods that are more sustainable and that keeps the money in the community because they're spending it on local inputs, they're spending it on their own kids and their own knowledge, let's do that. Um, so anyway, there, there's, there's a lot of agroecological methods. I'm sorry that I, I haven't been more specific, but carb no, no, rotation, okay. green manure is one of them. Um, a lot of other uh, potential methods to do really cool stuff. So Natalie, what do you think? I mean, you have 275,000 U.S. farmer customers, probably the equivalent number around the world. Is the vision that Jahi is laying out um, something that can exist side by side with the you know large scale monoculture that we see in the Midwest here? Are you worried about losing market share if the word gets out about these alternative things? What's Monsanto's point of view on this? Sure. So here's our point of view. Agriculture has to keep improving everywhere. And agriculture doesn't look the same everywhere. There's very different kinds of farming systems. And even now we're getting to the point where we realize even on one farm, there's different farming systems. And so where there's, I think, a lot of agreement would be that we need to keep improving. And, and I hope we all understand that um, when a company is really embedding sustainability as part of its business, it's thinking about how am I going to grow my business? What kind of investments am I going to make that are going to benefit my business and all of society? And I think that there is a, re a really strong consensus in growing, especially with the kind of um, awareness in New York a few weeks ago around climate change at the UN summit, that we really are going to need to be pulling together to understand how are we going to improve these agriculture systems around the world, working very closely with farmers. We feel like science has to be a big part of that equation. We have to grow more food in the next 36 years than we have in all of mankind's history accumulated. I, as a mom with a four and a nine year old, I really worry about the kind of world my kids are gonna live in. That's why I'm really excited that there's folks like you that are thinking about this and, and considering that you're, you wanna be part of this challenge. Um, this is a big challenge that's gonna take us using, I believe, science and innovation as well as real understanding of farmers and what their needs are in different places. We're going to need to be combining the best practices out there that are in conventional, that are in biotechnology, that are in um, organic, that are in new kinds of areas that are being explored. And I think that there's right now a really exciting kind of um, coalition of different different players that are recognizing this and figuring out how, how they can work together. Can I give a couple examples Please of do, and then I also want to invite your questions in just a minute, even though I have a bunch more. So after Natalie's okay. finished, I want to go to the audience. So, so yeah, I mean, Jahi outlined his vision for, for example, what agriculture in the developing world might look like. Mm -hmm. um, what's Monsanto doing to help farmers outside the U.S.? Right, okay. So, um, I, I would say, so one, one challenge for me, and, and to hear a comment like, you know, farmers need to be able to keep their money in their communities as though they're not able to keep their money in their communities when they're using um, some of these better seeds as well as other tools. The science says that more of it stays in the community when they're buying more inputs locally. So I've been in, um, you know, I've talked to many farmers in developing countries. Um, I've been with farmers, for instance, in India who can point to um, things in their house that are different today because they had access to cotton 
that was improved through breeding and biotechnology so that they were spraying less pesticides, they were saving money, they were increasing their income. Um, one study showed that they were able, 85% of them were able to send um, their kids to school, 85 improvement on that, 78% improvement in terms of nutrition. These are really important things to their household. That's not to say that's solving the whole problem by any means. I mean, these are really complex challenges, but I think it's important for us to recognize that giving them better tools that help them manage risk and um, reduce their inputs, which also improves their bottom line, um, is, it, it can be done through business with them. Now, I will say that um, in Africa, I agree with you completely, big challenges there, really big challenges there. And one of the things we recognized in working with farmers the market's not working very efficiently. There's not a lot of choice for those farmers today. I've been um, in farmers in Africa where most of the farmers there are women, by the way, and um, I've had them sometimes, one woman in particular really got to me. She had a very, they have a small plot of land, much smaller than this auditorium generally. They are, um, in her case, she was feeding seven children, some her own, some orphaned from a sibling that she had lost to HIV. She had a handful of seeds that she knew were not going to produce enough for her family. She knew that she was going to have a big hunger season ahead of her. And she grabbed my wrist, knowing that I worked for a seed company, grabbed my wrist and basically pleaded with her eyes that she needed better seed. It's not the only thing she needs, but she needs better seed as one of those things. And the person who was interpreting for us was explaining this and saying, she, she's willing to pay for seed because she knows this is important for her. Here's one of her biggest challenges though, is that there isn't a vibrant seed system where she can access better seeds. And that again is just one part of the challenge. But the other challenge for her is that drought is a real, real risk that's only getting worse in the face of climate change. So when she makes an investment in better seeds and fertilizer as an example, she has a higher risk of losing that investment to a drought, and she just can't afford that, that risk. And so one of the things we did recognizing this is that we formed a partnership with an organization, an NGO based in Nairobi, um, with five African governments, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, South Africa, Mozambique, with a big public research institution called CIMIT that has done wonderful work in better conventional breeding for African conditions. And we've got generous funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Howard Buffett Foundation, and U.S. Agency for International Development. And the goal of this project was realizing corn is a staple for these farmers. 300 million Africans depend on it for their livelihoods. Um, they, to Jahi's point, they have about a tenth of the kind of yields that are experienced in other parts of the world. Huge opportunity for improvement. If we can help them manage the risk of drought so that they could invest in the other inputs they need and plan for, for what they're going to do with their farm, that could really help them and help them adapt to climate change. This partnership started seven years ago and we just released our first seed in Kenya. And um, it got about almost three times the yield of other seeds on the market. We have an entire pipeline of new seeds coming. Monsanto in this project donated 700 corn lines from around the world that had more drought tolerance. We combined it with that cement germplasm from Africa and got huge improvements, huge improvements. We also donated in um, the drought tolerance transgene, biotech gene, and the insect protected one here in the United States, and those are in development. And what will come out of this are two different kinds of seeds. They can have conventional seed through the breeding, they can have it with biotech as well. And the best part in my mind is that this will be open source to all seed companies serving sub-Saharan farmers in Africa. So you're treating the intellectual property there differently than you do when you're dealing with Western farmers what, here in the U.S. What we recognized was that we really needed the entire seed system to become much more vibrant and essentially giving farmers this, this insurance to some extent from drought. Because what we want to see happen is a very vibrant seed company, seed, seed system, where farmers have a lot of choice. And I have to tell you something, that when I used to talk about this project, I used to highlight the humanitarian part of it. 
that it's all royalty free to these seed companies, um, and it's really meant to be a humanitarian project to, to get the market going. People would say, yeah, but aren't you guys looking to make them into customers and don't you have some other motive here? Well, yeah, but this is the right thing to do. You know what I think differently? I really feel today very strongly that farmers like these women farmers in Africa deserve a lot more than the goodwill of a company like ours. They deserve to be customers that we want to work hard to understand their needs, to invest in what they need, to fight to earn their business. And so I'm really, frankly, most excited about the part of this project that means all the competitors will get it for free. Because if we can build up this kind of seed system for farmers, these farmers, they'll have a lot of choice. But I want to be very clear, that's just the seed. They need a lot of other things. They need access to credit. They need access to markets. We need to understand the gender aspects of this. This is a really important part of it. We just, um, we've, we've now got somebody who's really focused on the gender part of um, these seeds as we're trying to help with the distribution and the pipeline that we're developing. But Natalie, anyway, let's give them a, a chance. No, that's great. Excited. I'm glad you did that, and I'm glad you're excited too. Um, I can't see, but I hope there's someone lined up at a microphone somewhere because we're videotaping this. If you can just come and ask a quick question, I hope. Oh, there you are. Hi. Um, my name is Sonia. I'm with the University of Oregon, and I just wanted to read a quick quote from the New Yorker, and then I have a question. Um, although India bans genetically modified food crops... You have, to read, you have to speak a little more slowly. It's hard to hear you up here. Although India bans genetically modified food crops, BT cotton modified to resist the bollworm is planted widely. Since the 1990s, Vandana Shiva has focused the world's attention on uh, Maharashtra by referring to the region as India's suicide belt and saying that Monsanto's introduction of genetically modified cotton there has caused genocide. There is no place where the battle over the value, safety, ecological impact, or economic implications of genetically engineered products has been fought more fiercely. Shiva says that 284,000 Indian farmers have killed themselves because they cannot afford to plant BT cotton. Earlier this year, she said farmers are dying because Monsanto whoa, 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 is making whoa, whoa. profits whoa. by owning life. Question. Hold on, by owning life that is never created but is but pretends to create. That is why we need to reclaim the seed. That is why we need to get rid of the GMOs, and that is why we need to stop the patenting of life. My question is: Have you heard of the term greenwashing? What was the question? We heard the term greenwashing. Have you heard of the term greenwashing? <laughs> Did you understand that? So I think I understood. But that. were you asking, is there a claim there about um, Indian farmer suicides in there somewhere from Bandana Shiva? Is that what the question was fundamentally about? I think that's what we're I think, I think so. so. Okay. okay. Do you, you want to respond to that? Yeah. And maybe you can, well, I, I would refer anyone who's interested in that issue. And Jai, you can quarrel with me about it to the long to. profile of Vandana Shiva that ran in the New Yorker maybe six or eight weeks ago, but go ahead. So um, I think that's a really critical issue. And I could tell you talking to my Indian colleagues, it's something that's really upsetting to them is that there's this challenge um, around the culture of suicides amongst farmers. Um, more than half the hungry people in the world are farmers. And um, what what I would argue, and this is one of the things I have a challenge with, is this impression that these farmers aren't really smart business people who are making really good choices. Uh, Bolgar cotton, that, that insect protected cotton, has when been um, adopted now by about 8 million farmers in India. They stand in line for access to that. There is a, a report I would um, encourage you to look at by IFPRI, which is a public sector institution that really looked at what are the challenges around farmer suicides, which does have to do with debt challenges, but the improvements in income that farmers have realized through Bullgard and Set Protected Cotton, and that that is not the linkage there. The other thing I would note, it, note is that the farmers themselves became quite frustrated with this linkage that's not real, and that in fact this cotton has really helped them improve their livelihoods enormously by improving their yields and their economic income. And they actually published their own study by the farmers themselves, where it was a socioeconomic study um, of the benefits that it's brought to them. 
Jahi, do you want to talk about the, you know, respond to the question? Do you feel like we're, we're um, allowing Monsanto to be too much unchallenged here in our conversation? I take it that was the implication of the question. Uh, yeah, seems, seems to be. <laughs> um, well, so I mean, I would say for one thing, it, it's interesting and important to have these stories of personal experiences and conversations. Uh, India, being a massive country, also has many Indians who agree with Shiva. Whatever her point, whatever you think of the objective correctness of it, there are people who agree with you, there are people who agree with Vandana, there are people who are in other positions. So it's not as if all Indian farmers have, again, sort of voted and written a letter from all millions of them and said that we all agree. Um, if you want, I think, really careful study of this, the anthropologist Glenn Davis Stone at uh, uh, Washington University in St. Louis has really focused on the fact that there are flaws both in the GMO seeds cause suicide, GMO seeds are the problem narrative, and problems with GMO seeds are really producing a lot of objective benefits that he has studied in India for decades and that the story is much more complicated. It has been good for farmers in some cases, has been really bad for them in others. The suicides from Glenn's point of view, and I think he's absolutely correct, comes from the debt cycle and the more broad green revolution input heavy system. And it's true that farmers line up for these seeds because, as, as you sort of referenced, they need a lot of things. There's a lot of farmers that they need something to improve their condition. And Monsanto has the money to be there. Monsanto has several times uh, more money than the entire country of Malawi. It's about, about 10 times the size. We need these farmers to have some kind of help. If Monsanto's the only people who are there, then of course they're going to stand in line for that. But we know from these alternative methods that you can really make this system work if you kick started with having a diversity of crops, which around the world, Mexico has a system called milpa, uh, a lot of traditional Indian systems that when you support them, what they do, they don't just grow one crop for export and sale. They grow a bunch of crops, and when one fails, as might happen in drought, they've got other ones to depend on. Uh, they're able to innovate, mix and match seeds, have lots of different varieties. And this open source innovation is something that we need more support of, and as good as some of this work that Monsanto uh, might be doing might be, the model is certainly not going to be for all of the poor farmers in the world to never buy their seeds or to only innovate using well-supported public infrastructure with lots of diversity. Okay. But that's the, that's the one that keeps the money in the community and it's totally possible, just we haven't invested in it because if it's not going to generate profits right now, then people aren't going to go and say, yes, let's help improve your education, let's help improve uh, the rest of your system. And I just wanted to note, I, I'm not sure if we ever got an answer to the question earlier as to when you're counting the percentage of market share that Monsanto had, if you're counting licensees. No, we have a branded business and we have licensees. But so you don't count licensees who are selling your products as part of your market share? No. She, well, I think I, she not made for that our clear. branded business. Yeah. So the 30% was Monsanto branded, branded business. Branded business but, and we have licensees. Yeah. Um, let's, take, let's take another question. Um, and again, please identify yourself and ask a question. Uh, my name is Nicole. I'm from Presidio Graduate School. Uh, my question is for both of you. Jahi, you can, if you can speak on um, what you've seen and from what you uh, can, I guess, just tell from it. Um, why are big agriculture companies fighting against the fight to label GMOs if transparency is the future of business? So. So, um, let me tell you what we're for. We're for voluntary labeling where people can have choice of um, different kinds of products they want. And there's a very vibrant labeling system right now, voluntary labeling, that allows people to choose organic. They can choose non-GMO. There's a lot of that there. A lot of this debate around labeling was about mandatory labeling by our government, which is based on a safety or a nutritional difference in the food proven by science. There have been, GMOs are the most studied food in our system. There are hundreds of studies looking at the safety of those products. And the World Health Organization, the American Medical Association, national academies from multiple countries around the world have studied and found those products that are on the market as safe as other products. And so there is not a safety or nutritional difference to warrant change in that mandatory label. I have to tell you as a mother, this is a really important issue to me. Because I want 
the government's mandatory label of food to be if there is a safety or nutritional difference proven by science. If you now open that up to not be about science, but just be about preference, now it's marketing. But Natalie, there's a nutrition label on food that says here are the ingredients. That's not, that's it, what the pro-label people are saying. Simply tell us one more bit of information about Which those ingredients. Say, absolutely, through voluntary labeling. So if they want to label something as non-GMO, it can be labeled as such. Jai, your thoughts on this issue? I should have asked it myself. Uh, well, so... You know, there's uh, poll numbers that 93% of Americans want to see GE labeling. You look more closely at that, 25% of Americans say they've never heard of genetic modified food. 26% thought it was already required to be labeled. Uh, I would say that Monsanto and a number of other companies said they really want to get the message out there and get people better educated on what they think are the benefits and the relatively, from their point of view, relatively low amount of risks. I would say there's no better way to make that conversation absolutely happen than labeling. If 25% of people don't know that exists, if you label it, then we can have that conversation because everyone will know. They'll say, well, what is this label on here? And uh, I, I told a colleague years ago, um, we don't base our decision on whether or not someone gets to know something on whether or not they agree with our interpretation of it. So I would say actually, there are lots of studies of the safety of GMO. I wouldn't say that they said they're just as safe as all other, all other food because we haven't tested all other food. We don't actually have a safety standard for all other food. They've tested it against specific other controls, but we don't have a really good monitoring system of knowing how safe any given food is, whatever the source is. Let's go to the audience again. Please. David Wilcox, Reach Scale. Um, I'd like to suggest to both Jahi and Nicole that Speak into the mic and please. And I'd like to suggest to, to all of you, really, to the whole audience, that there's an entire sector that is working on solutions to this problem that are non traditional. And because the large players don't know this sector, they will always over invest in the traditional solutions. And I'd just like to give a couple examples and ask you to share whether you're familiar with this, whether you think it deserves more investment. So um, Quickly, David, we're almost out of time. One Acre Fund is a financial innovation. Iggy Bossi's organization in Ghana is the largest selling branded rice crop in Ghana. It brings the income all the way back from the end consumer to the smallholder farmer. It doesn't ca just capture the local, it captures the whole supply chain. Um, securing water for food was USAID's grand challenge. There were only two scale winners. One of them brings completely new women into the cycle, completely new land at schools, produces high quality vegetables, half which go to the poor kids, half which are resold. Every school becomes sustainable with one investment. So those are three examples of social enterprises that are bringing cross sector and cross supply chain innovations that need more investment because they create transformative movements as opposed to incremental yield, incremental land, incremental women involved. I think those are great examples and I think you're absolutely right that a holistic value chain approach is absolutely essential. Um, we work with the One Acre Fund and that WEMA project is an example, um, so thank you for raising that. I think those are really important points. Let's take okay. another question here. Let's try to make it a Twitter-like question, if you can. Um, hi, thank you for speaking. Um, I have a Twitter question. Um, uh, into the mic, it's a little hard to hear. Jahi, I wanted to hear your opinion on the bees, on oh. how the 97% of these big, farmer, uh, big companies are hurting or helping the bees and their part in that. Man. So I'm a, I'm a scientist and I'm a professor, so I mean, that could be, we're, we're talking backstage, there's any number of questions that I would like to sit you all down, down and, and give you a three-hour lecture and then we'd have a conversation. Um, can you, can you give I'm sure all of you would you? enjoy that and stay for the entire three hours. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that Mark and I were talking about really briefly before we came on was uh, large farms and monocultures. and. I would say that another part of our problem is that most of the products that Monsanto and related companies are marketing are products meant to be used on monoculture. 
especially on really large scale monoculture. And as an ecologist, I don't think that there is a future for biodiversity with monoculture. It's a little bit too much to say nature abhors a monoculture, but only a little bit too much. You know, those are biological deserts. And so we see from this overall model, from the pesticides, from decreasing the amount of uh, roadside strips, from other, other uh, habitat areas, from turning forests into fields, we, we are really decreasing not just honeybee diversity, but all sorts of bee diversity. And there's a lot of, again, alternative systems, smaller farms, more heterogeneous landscapes, having little different things uh, planted. And in Europe, they do have some uh, support for things like hedgerows and uh, uh, strips where pollinators can get food, can get rest, can get habitat. So this, again, is sort of this alternative model that it's not that there's no place for technology or innovation, but it's a different kind of innovation. It's much more focused on the small farm and just, Mark doesn't believe me yet, but he, he's, going to read the, he's going to read the studies. <laughs> there's something called the inverse productivity relationship uh, with farm size. Smaller farms in study after study, by and large, are found to be more productive per unit area than larger farms. And that's just what the studies say. Okay. Uh, so if we're really thinking about science-based uh, uh, tasks, we should be thinking about land distribution or other ways to break up uh, large farms and make sure farmers are still making a living, but we can't have these huge monocultures and have bees and have uh, profitable farmers. Okay. Please, and then we'll go so, that quick. We want to keep giving people okay, a chance. Okay. I, I want to comment on that because I think this is a really important point. So one of the things that's very fundamental to the, what I agree with you on is that we need to be managing farms much more in a precise way. Okay, that one I absolutely agree. But if you take an organization like Conservation International, one of the largest biodiversity NGOs in the world, this is what their mission is about. We've had a six-year partnership with them in Brazil around the Cerrados Atlantic Forest. We want farmers there to be planting on the land they have today and not be cutting down rainforest. And in order for them to do that and meet their livelihood, they need to improve their productivity. And NGOs like, like CI see um, the kind of products we make as one part of that kind of sustainable intensification that allows farmers to, to have high productivity, use their resources efficiently, and not need to be cutting down that land. But I'll tell you the other thing that I think is important is bringing in the financial sector. So one of the things we're doing now is working with banks that are trying to give better lending terms to these farmers that are working within this kind of a system so that they're preserving the forest. I think that's really important um, to realize is that we're going to, the amount of people we need to feed with the land we have, we're going to be needing to do this in a way that's going to not have us make trade-offs. Okay, I we got to stop. Disagree, whoa, but whoa, 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 whoa. We got to stop. I'm sorry. I'm getting a lot of signals from okay. the floor. But so there's good news and bad news. Um, the bad news is we're done here. Uh, the good news is that both Natalie and Jahi have agreed to continue this conversation. And so those of you who want to meet with them in a more relaxed way or just continue it in this more formal way, uh, please join us in room 101F immediately after this session. You can also stay here in this room. The next topic here is called Levering Technology for Global Education. And uh, aside from that, I want to wish you a great rest of the day and thank you all for coming to the Net Impact Conference. And thank our panelists, please.